So this is week three of the first unit, and I'm pleased to welcome our speaker, Dr. Will Briggs, from our campus. Dr. Will Briggs got his master's degree from Georgia Tech in 1989 and his PhD from the University of Texas at Arlington in 1996. Since 1998, Dr. Briggs has been here as a professor of computer science, and he says, as some people in this room already have reason to know, uh, because they have things due imminently, uh, perhaps soon after this class. In October, Dr. Briggs' first book came out, C++ for Lazy Programmers, which was an introductory text for the Computer Science 141 and 142 classes. In fall 2018, Dr. Briggs taught one of the pilot classes to become the new Dell first seminar in a class in critical thinking. And this lecture that we'll hear today is an outgrowth of that and of a lifelong interest in writing and reading science fiction and of spending, he says, possibly too much time on the internet. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Briggs. Thank you. Can I be heard? Can you hear me? I haven't done things with a microphone before. Uh, thank you. Maybe one of the games that you'll be playing on that uh, game night that you just heard about could be Chrononauts. Sorry, Chronology. Chrononauts is another game. And I want I, this all started with Chronology, this game. It's a game in which this clicker doesn't work. Let's see if this works. Well, that works anyway. <clears throat> you have these cards, and when it's your turn, you're supposed to, you get new cards and somebody reads the card to you, reads what was done, and you're supposed to figure out where it fits on this timeline. So, here we have the invention of band-aids. It tends to be things like that. We have another invention to put in. This is the invention of aerosol spray cans. Do you think it would come before or after? I heard before. Let's find out. Nope. Wasn't too far off, though. And scuba. When was scuba invented? Was it be before 1920, between 1920 and 1926, or after 26? Before? Not doing too well here. And I found out that it was really hard to do well. And so I thought, this is interesting. I want to find out when the big inventions and the big uh, scientific theories of the past uh, 200 years were done and see if I find out anything interesting. So I made this Excel spreadsheet because that's what you don't want to do if you want to find things out as you play games and you get out Excel. I don't even know if you can see that. I hope you can in the back. It's a relativity. Uh, Dr. Fryer, can you read that from there? Okay, good. So I'm looking at the big scientific theories when they came about. Relativity and quantum mechanics not too far apart. Radioactivity leading up to that and electromagnetism by Maxwell. They were putting things together in what's called the standard model. Biology was doing quite a bit as well. Let's see, I want to keep track of what time it is. Um, biology had a lot of stuff going on, especially around that time frame. Germ theory by Pasteur, genetics by Mendel. DNA came later with Watson and Crick. Periodic table for chemistry. The Big Bang theory from 1930 by uh, Catholic priest Lemaitre. I hope I said that right. Oh, I'm going a little too far. So these are the big things. I mean, there are smaller things, but I thought these were the biggest things. Well, it looks like we got a lot of stuff going around 1860 and other things uh, filtering in. I said, okay, well, let's also look at invention since that's what chronology really did. And they didn't call it the age of invention for nothing. There's a bunch of inventions all around that period of Edison and Bell and so on. I thought I'd, and eh, there were things that felt like they needed mentioning, but some of them came a little too soon, so I just put, stuck them at the top. 
photography was way earlier than I thought it was going to be. And I think next up is, no, nope. looks like war is good for science or an invention. <coughs> we got, we got nuclear bombs. Yay for us, I guess. <coughs> and these other things. When was the airplane invented? You probably know that one. North Carolina won't let you forget. What about the television? What do you think is a reasonable ballpark for that? Nineteen thirty-eight. You didn't just look that up, did you? Uh, <laughs> uh, Nineteen sixty. Let's see. Nineteen uh, twenties. We found that it was always earlier than you thought it was because it takes a while for the inventions to get to market. I was just kind of getting a rule of thumb. It's always 20 years earlier than the first time I'd heard of it. It's not a very good rule of thumb, though. There's radio. Uh, let's see. How about things that relate to the computer? We got the computer here, and the silicon chip came later and made it a lot more useful. There's the Internet. Plastics came way earlier than I had any idea because I only heard of that around the 50s. But then there were nylon. There's nylon in the uh, in the 30s, and apparently it came from the 1850s, and a bunch of other stuff. And so it's sort of filling in what it looks like we're getting, and what what can we find out by looking at it? I say we can find out that it kind of comes in clumps. Could just be random chance. And there's something going on down here, or rather there's not something going on down here. Why is it that your lifetime doesn't have anything showing up in it? Are you responsible for this? Now, I think the first reaction to this is, what do you mean we're the most advanced society in history? And yeah, the world civilization is more advanced than anybody in history. We've got smartphones, we've got Mohs surgery, we've got improving solar cells and batteries. So I think we need to give civilization credit for doing a great job at refining existing ideas. And I'm not seeing the next big thing like uh, a science like ev evolution or a technology like building the Terminator, which could be a good thing. And this is what we were expecting. I didn't get a picture of it, but I picked up a book at a yard sale this weekend. It was The World of 2000, written in 1973. Cities are gone, because not, not obliterated, but like, why would anybody want to live there? The computer takes care of everything and so on. According to this, before you were born, we were supposed to have moon bases and intrigue with aliens. So that didn't quite happen. About the time you were born, we got a moon base and a manned mission to Jupiter and a computer that can be smart enough to try to kill all the astronauts. And when you were a tween, we got an extra sun in the sky. and more alien contact. That is to say, we expected things to continue. I just tried to fill in like new tech or, or something down here. You got clumpiness still, but we kind of expected this to happen. We'd still have things to fill in. And I would say that maybe we expected a little more than that. In the 1970s, there was the book Future Shock about how it was just, things were just going to accelerate so fast, we couldn't handle it all. Like culture shock, only it's in your own culture. There was a branch of science fiction called cyberpunk that finally took the idea that instead of, we have lots of new inventions that make our story work, and then everything just sits there. And Star Trek was kind of like that. You had the warp drive and the transporter and the phasers, and pretty much just sat there. No, it's going to be continually changing, and you're just not going to be able to keep up. So maybe we're expecting more than that. 
But I think we should, we should expect more than that. Another thing I got uh, last week is a book, Lost in Math. It's a physicist writing about, you know, where's the next big thing in physics? And she said, well, I looked at the number of PhDs granted per year, and we've got about 100 times as many physicists as there were 100 years ago. So what that means is that we should be able to get about a century's worth of research done by 1800 standards or 1900 standards in a single year, right? And that's definitely not happening. Maybe that's unrealistic because after all, physicists work in parallel. And I don't mean to pick on physicists. It could have worked for any science. So maybe it should be 10 years. If that's true, I think we should have expected something more like this. Like it chugs along and then it's going off the charts here. We've got way more scientists than we ever did. People who are paid to do research, people who are made to come up with new ideas, the corporations are doing this, the world's population is bigger, especially the first world has grown, we're all way more educated, and we're throwing a lot more money at it. You know, Edison was having to come up with his own and, and maybe get some investors and so on. Now the government says, okay, I'm giving out grants. If you think about the way it works out in your life, um, I don't know exactly when the Jetsons was supposed to be happening, but I just took a picture from there. Here's an ad that I found from the 1950s for a new home. And here's an ad from whenever the Jetsons lived for what their homes would be like. And they had Rosie the Robot. Have you ever seen the Jetsons? Okay. You had Rosie the Robot doing things, and they had the electric beds and so on. And, and <clears throat> so this is what we should expect. But I'm, I'm lifting this from a newspaper pundit named Mark Stein, who wrote this in his book, After America. He had some Rip Van Winkle go to sleep in 1890 and wake up in 1950. He's just in the home. He says, well, let's see, the horse is gone, and we've got the horseless carriage. We've got machines that are washing the clothes and that are drying the clothes and that are keeping the food cold. We've got a dishwasher. We've got um, a television, so we can have dramas right there in there in the room with us. And then you get a call from your sister in California. And it's not a telegraph. And it sounds like she's right there. OK, they did have telephones, but it, it was a great deal rarer. So he got a big future shock. And then he goes to sleep again for 60 years and wakes up uh, more or less when you were a tween. And there's still a car. And there's still a washing machine. And there's a refrigerator. And there's the dishwasher. And there's the dryer. And we've got phones. They're in our pockets now. The TV has been replaced, partially at least. It's, it's replaced in our home by a computer. And so now, when you go from 1950 to 2010, you find that you're able to stream Justin Bieber videos 24-7. So there's not the big future shock we expected. Now, there are some things that we shouldn't have expected. And this, if I can use the scroll thing effectively, no nope, wrong way. Uh, Okay, space travel is expensive. And this is not because we don't know how to do it, although that might be true. It's because it takes an enormous amount of money to, I'll put it this way, it takes a lot more money to fling something into the outer space at 30 times the speed of sound in real life than it does in the movies. So we're, I think we're gonna have to give ourselves a pass on space travel. Uh, this is what we got instead of, of the Jetsons. We got, this was taken from this year. Okay, it's nice. I don't see much difference. The computer seems to be an exception to this. We got cell phones all over the world. We got uh, people in third world countries, they got the cell phones. They probably need them more because the landlines don't work as well. 
We got new versions coming out every year. And I think we pay a lot of attention because we're often sitting in front of the computer and so we'll notice when something new comes out. This though is, it's not just appearing to be doing very well, it really is doing very well. I got this graph here um, of, here's the year, and here is calculations per second uh, divided by something, something like that, oh, per thousand dollars, but it works out however you do it. Every year, computing power improves. There's something called Moore's Law that says computing power doubles every 18 months. And that's not from physical principles or anything, it's just an observation of what's happened. They do continually get faster and they do continually get smaller and therefore they continually get more capable. When I was in graduate school, we had a little symposium on campus about artificial intelligence, which was my area. And the conclusion was just, it's not because we in AI research are any good, it's just the computers are faster now and they can do the same things we were trying to get them to do 20 years ago and they couldn't handle it. People are continually wondering if we're about to hit a wall, but we haven't yet. So computers are fast, and we're great at getting them to market, and I think that's why we perceive, oh, things have changed so much. The cell phone is in the pocket. That's the computer. It can do way more than they could in the 1970s. That's the computer. But for other things, I want to look for some explanations. I'm going to take a brief detour into what the reaction, what reaction I might have had or you might have had when we first heard this because we know we are the most advanced people in history. Of course, knowledge doesn't go away. The librarians are, very, are our friends, and they keep it, and all this stuff is stored somewhere, so we're not losing the technology. Of course, we're the most advanced. <clears throat> I think the gut reaction is gonna be, ew, I don't wanna think that about us. I wanna think that, that we're way more enlightened than people that didn't even know how to use Google, and we do know more. But this is sort of about the rate of change. And I started thinking about cognitive dissonance because when I was bringing this up to people, I got some reactions that surprised me. One was, are you out of your mind? There are a lot of recent inventions. Electricity, the telephone, but that's not recent. Agriculture, okay, nobody actually said agriculture. Um, or, yeah, but you didn't, cons I'm gonna really exaggerate it, you didn't consider that now we've got Visual Studio 2019. Yeah, there are continual developments. I thought, what's going on here? I think what's going on here is that I would like to think that we're doing well. And the thing is, we actually are. So this isn't really about that. Jonathan Haidt is a researcher, a cognitive researcher, and he says that we, go, we like to think we go where reason takes us, but gut instinct counts for a lot. We like to follow the gut. Well, we can follow the gut, but for the next however much longer I've got, uh, the next uh, half hour or so, I'll say we're gonna let reason just come out and play, and then at the end of it, we can decide, did we go the wrong direction? Is, is this working out for us? So, I want to think of some explanations. And these are the ones that I either heard or was able to think of. One is, this is an illusion. And I think we should consider whether this is all just an illusion, because it's just somebody playing in Excel. You didn't consider invention X. Um, for example, hybrid cars. Uh-oh. They were invented in 1889. Now, there are going to be other things. I mentioned this earlier. There are going to be other things that really were recent inventions. And I'm going to say, yeah, we can count that. I don't think it's as big as surgery. Most surgery isn't as big as surgery. Most surgery is a, a, a very quick, clean way, apparently, of, of uh, dealing with skin cancer. And it's, it's, I'm really glad we have it. I'm not going to put it up there with germ theory of disease. But, and I didn't even mention surgery. 
we can fill in this spreadsheet with things that we have now, but I think if we do, we're gonna be filling in the rest of it, and I don't think the shape of it's gonna change, so it's gonna to have to be something else. This one, I thought, oh, I like this. There are inventions that I don't know about yet. And in 50 years, they'll be filling in the period from 2000 to 2020 with something that was just in some a journal somewhere that nobody's heard of. Because it takes too long for us to get things where they're going. Now, I'm still kind of wondering about the, we don't know what to do with it at all yet. I can't go with it takes too long for things to get to market because it took plastics 100 years. It took TV 20 years. And it took smartphones four years. I think we're better at getting things to market quickly than we were before. This one, it's a little harder to get good numbers on it, but one thing I found said that these days it's about eight years to do the FDA testing process. I'm going to guess that before you apply to the FDA, it's not as long as that. It's maybe, maybe shorter than that, but I don't really know. And I really like this one. That is to say, things used to be easier. We're working on harder problems. And I think there's a good case for this. I want you to consider what you would need to verify that there's this stuff in the air called oxygen that candles need to burn. What do you got to have? I think you know where I'm going, right? You need a candle, you need a match, and you need a jar to put over the candle so it can use up the oxygen. You can do this this afternoon. You've probably got most of the equipment and it would take you two minutes, if that. Finding the Higgs boson might be a little tougher. That took a particle accelerator that was about $6 billion to build and a lot of work. So I can really credit this part. This one also. That we used to have a professor here named Ann Reeve in the chemistry department, and she gave a science gang talk. There's a science gang talk tonight, 7 o'clock, I think, um, on uh, vector space. Someone from vector space is coming to talk about what they do. Anyway, she gave one. She talked about how drugs are made. She said, well, the, the way we do it, or maybe, maybe I misremember, and it's one of the ways we do it, is we'll take a chemical. And we'll say, let's do something small to that, can move a hydrogen around and see if it does anything useful. If that's how you're doing it, and I'm, I'm not sure that that's really uh, all of how they're doing it, then if you have some number of atoms you're willing to have in your molecule, then you've got a, a, you only got a certain number of possible molecules you can build out of it. It may be very large, but still, that's only a small, only a particular set of it. What happens when you use up all of those, when you've tried all the combinations? You're going to need something else. I don't know how many atoms they've gotten up to, but I'm going to guess that once they get up to 1,000 atoms, if they haven't already, then adding one more hydrogen here or there probably isn't going to make a lot of difference. They're going to need something else. Maybe it's time for a paradigm shift, but that's not this slide. I think there's something to this. I'm not sure how much to put into it. <clears throat> Insulin took, I think it was two years to get to market. So somebody had an idea. That might have been a previous year. And then they started developing it, and it was a market in two years. <clears throat> yeah, three years, counting, counting the time building it. The FDA approval process takes, takes longer now. I don't want to imply this is just a science problem. Um, my own doctor's office, they were saying that they had to join Centra because they had so much paperwork now. So, yeah, everybody always says paperwork increases all the time, and it seems that they are right. 
there's a story I want to digress into because it's really very good. Scott Alexander is a blogger. He is, he's either a psychiatry resident or maybe he's a psychiatrist by now because I've been following for some time. And he said, we've got this intake question when we've got somebody brought in in crisis to the psych ward. It's something like, do you sometimes feel really good and sometimes feel really bad? And I think it's supposed to maybe screen for bipolar. So let's correlate that with whether or not we find out they actually have bipolar and find out if there's any point in this question, because I don't think there is. And so he put together a little project where what they're going to do is they're going to uh, you know, look at these things and correlate diagnosed with bipolar and answered yes to that question and see if there's any correlation. He had to do things the, the right way, so he went to their equivalent of the Human Rights Committee. We have something like that on campus. And the uh, director said, well, you've got to watch this video about what the Nazis did, so we make sure that you're not doing anything Nazi-like. Got it. Everybody who's been involved in the project has to watch it. Got it. Got to write a proposal. And the proposal has to have in it something like um, how you inform the patients of the dangers that, they, that he might go through or she might go through as a result of this. Well, there's no danger at all because we're, at, we're not even asking a new question. Doesn't matter, you've got to inform of the dangers. Do you realize what will happen if we take somebody who is possibly having a psychotic episode very much in distress and say, oh, and we're doing this experiment that might harm you? Doesn't matter, you've got to do it. You've got to say how you're protecting the patient data. We won't have access to it. It's going to stay in that file, and then we, do, we, we take this other thing, and we don't even record the names. Well, you've got to have a way of, so get the patient data so that you can protect it. Then it was found out that the person who administered the training for the, for the <clears throat> experimentation, the human rights sort of thing, had not herself gone through the training, and therefore everyone that she had trained was no longer trained. And so he took his notes and shredded them. That's probably an unusually bad case, but you can see how that would really get in the way. We also have more administrative costs. Now, I don't know how that affects people who are researchers in particular, but I know it seems to be society-wide. It's probably worldwide. I was recently reading that this was had 10 administrators for every seven workers actually involved in patient care in uh, the health industry. And this was before the Affordable Care Act. So I would assume it's increased because these things always do. Uh, we have significant higher, I was reading something, higher ed, why do we have so much administration? It's also true in lower ed. Your uh, high school or elementary school, if it's private, is likely to have or may have an enrollment officer which I thought, really? Do you need one at that level? And I don't, know, I don't know how much they can do for enrollment, but administration expands. I really wish that I could have found these graphs. Um, but it was memberships of certain either large churches or large groups of churches. And it had, I think it was something like 1990 to 2005, Southern Baptist kind of, it bumped a bit, but it stayed more or less stable. The administrative, the, pers the number of administrators per member going up. The number of administrators, period, going up. Catholic increased, okay. So the, its membership increased and the administrators going up. Understand in this case, obviously, administrators does not mean clergy. It would also mean uh, secretarial staff and so on. And then we had some that were decreasing, sometimes decreasing significantly in membership. Uh, Episcopal Church of America, United Methodist Church, their membership was just really going down. You can guess what was happening to the administrators. Going up. Everything goes up. And I think that's particularly interesting because... Churches are about as unregulated as you can get. Now, sometimes I think, okay, so we kind of have to do things the government tells us to do, and there are more of them, but I'm not sure that even applies there. I mean, maybe it does, but it goes up everywhere. It just seems to be a society-wide phenomenon. Okay. 
So, another explanation. It's about time for one of those paradigm shifts. Now, do you know what Kuhn's paradigm shifts are? I'm thinking you haven't done the reading yet, so let me talk about that a little bit. <clears throat> He's a philosopher of science. He says, this is the way it works. You've got some way of explaining your science, a way of explaining the world, like classical mechanics, uh, what you learned in high school science, uh, where you have the equations of motion and so on. And it's the 1800s, and we're starting to fill things in, test more things based on classical mechanics. And say, okay, that worked out great. But as you test more and more things, some things just aren't working anymore. You're finding you're doing things with electricity, and they don't quite work out. We don't know, is electricity a wave? Is it a particle? Oh, so even more so for, for light. And we end up with something like, we've got light particles. And they're coming through, I don't have a picture for this, but they're coming through a slot. So you're, you're aiming light through a slot. And you will find that even though if it's just a particle, it should just kind of hit. And you should get a, a neat little rectangle. But instead, you get something that's like if a wave of water hit it, and it would refract. And you get some sort of interesting pattern. Then you put two of them here, and you get two interesting patterns that interfere with each other. It really looks like uh, a graph of when waves hit something. But then there are other times when they don't look like waves at all, when they look like particles. So what am I going to do about that? Eventually, things get to be so broken that somebody comes along with a new way of understanding it. And then you've got a new paradigm. And it all starts all over again. So we have relativity as the new paradigm. And quantum mechanics handles other parts of it. Now we've got two conflicting paradigms. And it's been a hundred years for us to test this and try to fill in the gaps and, and uh, verify relativity really works. Quantum mechanics really works. They don't seem to work that well together necessarily. And we don't have a para their paradigm. People have been looking for this since probably the 1920s. <coughs> Earlier I had a slide with the uh, standard model, which is explaining why we get the kind of subatomic particles that we do. And then, um, sorry. We're look, hoping for the grand unified field theory, GUT, grand unified theory. Mm, can't seem to manage it. Some people will say, eh, I think maybe that works better for physics than other things. But um, since then, I think we've found that we can, we can adapt paradigms. But in some cases, it looks like we might need a new one. And I'm waiting. And I have been waiting for some time. And this one is just so fuzzy that I don't know what, I, I, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't have put it up here, but I wanted to put it up here because it, it occurred to me, and it does seem to happen in history, that is to say, we haven't had a civilization before modern world civilization that could really do all this research, but that freezes up in other ways. Like, we've got our historians here who could give the next lecture on why Rome fell. I don't know why Rome fell, but it, it had its army, it had its economy, it had its government, it had its tax structure, and things stopped working. Maybe whatever it is that froze them up uh, is freezing up our research. It's not just Rome that did this. There's a lot of other places that had the same thing going. China had something a little different in the 1500s. It was seen to be doing quite well with the research, and the emperor said, that's it, no more research, I'm done. So... <clears throat> We might end up with something like that. Um, Islam, I wanted to mention Islamic civilization. It didn't lose its golden age just because, you know, it froze up. It, it was hit by a really powerful force, but then it didn't recover. So, I don't know, maybe this is happening with us as well. 
China seems to be going gangbusters these days. I don't know if they're going to continue to do that or if that's an illusion. I will say this, they seem to be really good on some things, like they're taking the lead in 5G, but I haven't seen the next big idea out of them yet. So, having given all these reasons, my question is, what's the right one? And I will take it from you because I surely don't know. Sociology, that in sociology what they'll do is they'll say, well, I think this accounts for 20% of what I'm seeing, and this is 40%, and this is 10%. They can do something with the statistics. I'm not any close to having statistics here, so it could very well be a combination of these things, or it could be something that I haven't even thought of yet. But I do know what I want to see happen. There it is. I want the Mars colony. I'm not going, but I want it. I want the cure for cancer in easy to swallow tablet form. Like many parents, I would like to have a cure for genetic diseases. We really don't know what to do with at this point. I think as a matter of collective guilt, we ought to bring back the dodo like the Jurassic Park scientists did in that movie. Don't bring back the T-Rex, but bring back the dodo. We actually killed that one. Let's have cold fusion. You do recognize that, right? Yeah, of course you recognize that. Cold fusion made out of uh, beer. You, the fuel is beer and used banana peels. <clears throat> and I want my hover car. So who's going to fix it? Any nominations? There's mine. So, you have a job to do. You can start by having some really insightful papers this week into this issue. Okay, I want to thank Senior Symposium, the Dell program, for supporting this, the makers of this game, and see if you have any questions. Low-hanging fruit, because it's definitely true. I don't know if it's everything, but it's definitely true. Does quantum computing going to be a real breakthrough? He's, oh, I'm sorry. Um, the question is, is quantum, quantum computing going to be a real breakthrough? And this is where I embarrass myself, because although it's my area, I don't know. Um, when I was first looking at it, I was thinking no, but they seem to have developed something. So I think you have to go with... I think it's Feynman's law. Whenever a scientist or an engineer says something can't be done, ignore him. When he says that it can, listen to him. So the question is, is it advancing and we just don't realize how much? And I think, um, no, maybe my graph here didn't recognize how much, but I think we tend to exaggerate it. Now, there are a lot of good things. There are cures for some of the cancers. They're not one in easy to swallow pill form, but there are cures for some of them now that generally work. And with, with Alexa, to me, it was not that we have something that can listen to us um, so much as in the 90s we were saying we don't even know how to understand human language even written form and Google or actually it wasn't Google it was it was Babelfish came on and said well we're gonna give you a really bad translation but it'll be good enough so there is something to that but I think that we expect it and we're just looking so much at the computer and the computer 
Its advantages are coming from the 1960s invention, the silicon chip, and we are still reaping the benefits of it. So the computers are getting smarter. I don't know about us. Was there something back here? Well, I, there's, the, there's the privacy issue, which I, I don't care for that at all, but that's a personal thing, not a research thing. In terms of the usefulness of big data, I just wish Dr. Curdy were here because he's doing a lot of stuff with that now. I don't know what you can get from big data. Um, I'm interested in some of the things, like I have a senior project student who will be looking into, I'm looking at the Facebook posts, I'm looking at what state you live in, and whether you said, uh, love or hate in the same post with, oh, let's say, Trump. Therefore, I will predict how people in your state are going to vote. Okay, you could get something interesting out of that. Now, is there going to be some sort of big thing? I don't know. I know when they did the, uh, when they did the, the discount purchase tracking cards at Kroger or whatever, they, they did a lot of data analysis and they determined that people who have dogs are more likely to write like ragu and people who like cats are more likely to like Prego, and I think, uh, okay, <laughs> so maybe, maybe. Um, maybe marketing implications, but you don't see that as a, what are they going to do with it? Are, I, I don't see it making a big breakthrough, but I, I don't know. <laughs> Other questions? Thank you, Mr. Great. Okay, thank you.